Hello, everyone. I'm very excited to have a friend here with me today. Nicole is going to share her endometriosis journey with us. Nicole, thank you so much for being on the podcast and on the YouTube video. I really appreciate it. Um, Nicole and I have known each other for a while, and we actually had like a fundraiser where we both told our stories in 2018. Gosh, that yeah. fe I can't believe that was 2018. <laughs> oh my goodness. Where, where we talked to a crowd of people and just shared our stories. So we decided that this would be really great to have her on the podcast. Nicole, thank you so much for coming on. And why don't you start off by just telling us a little bit about yourself that doesn't have to be endo related. Well, thank you for having me. I'm very excited to be here. Um, giving, having the opportunity to share my story is just something that empowers me while I empower other people. Um, but a little bit about me is I grew up in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. Um, so if those of you who don't know what that is, it's the better half of Michigan, in my opinion. <laughs> um, I moved down here for college right out of high school. Uh, I live in Detroit right now with my fiance and two dogs, I have a Golden Bernice, who's two, and a Springer Spaniel, who's five and a half. Um, I'm an architectural designer by day, uh, endo and mental health advocate by night. Um, I'm a co-founder of Period People, which is an Instagram page with um, Andrea, a friend with endo. Um, we run it together. It's for people with and without periods. We've shared our stories. We've talked about our tools. So um, that's a little bit about me and what I do. Um, yeah. Well, thank you so much for coming on and sharing your story with us. We really appreciate it. And um, let's just start from the top, like I normally like to do. <laughs> <laughs> tell, tell me when your uh, endo journey began. I was going to say adventure, but I don't know if I really want to classify it as it. I mean, it is an adventure. Oh, it's an adventure. <laughs> <laughs> but maybe more journey feels like a better word. <laughs> yeah. Um, when I was thinking about my journey, I've kind of broken it out into different chapters and there's been like significant turning points in my life. Um, but I knew about endometriosis before I even had a period and before I even um, had the sex ed talk about the birds and the bees. And I knew that because my mom had it. Um, my, my grandma had it and my great grandma had it. Uh, obviously it was a little bit different back then, but my mom pushed for the diagnosis and was one of the first people to do the Lupron trial, um, back when it first came around. So I was her miracle baby. And, um, I fast forward to eighth grade when everybody's supposed to start their periods. I still didn't have mine. Um, I never really had that first moment of, oh, this is my period. Um, and we, we decided that it would be best for me to go on birth control to help kind of prolong the endo from developing. Um, again, my, my mom did so much research on endo that she just like, that's what was the best knowledge for that time. Um, so in eighth grade, did you start your period or not yet? No, I didn't. Did you just go on birth control before I just, you started it? Yeah, I went on birth control before I wow. even started my period. So it's, um, my period kind of was, well, it was provoked by birth control. Got it. Uh, so throughout high school, um, it was like a very, very light period, then slowly got worse and worse and like clots and just everything that we've seen. Um, and you were still taking birth control like for yeah. all of high school. Yeah. Um, I switched a couple different times. Um, I had a traumatic brain injury in high school. So uh, just the hormone levels changed. So I switched birth control then. Um, and then there was a new birth control that came out. Yes. That was like supposed to be the miracle drug. I, I, I'm pretty sure I took that. That was oh, on yeah. one of my birth control checklists. <laughs> yep. <laughs> so I, jumped in that and didn't really think any different until uh, freshman year of college. And Did you have pain at all? Like, or were you just had like a light period, you were taking birth control and just going about your business in high school? So I was super active in high school. So I don't think I I'd never really had pain. Um, my best friend in high school had significant pain and 
she would talk to my mom about endometriosis all the time. And um, unfortunately, we lost, we've lost touch, so I don't know if she actually has it, but I wouldn't be surprised. Right. Um, but no, for me, I didn't really have painful periods in high school. Um, I would miss school because I was nauseous. I was so, so nauseous. I remember there were days where I'd wake up and get ready for school, and I was in the middle of getting ready, and I'd throw up. And it, it, I think that's just the effect that the birth control had on my body. Sure. Um, so I don't know. Uh, that never really occurred to me that that probably messed up my mental health <laughs> a little bit in high school. Um, but yeah, in freshman year of college, I started getting the pain. And that was moving from the Upper Peninsula to the Lower Peninsula in the Detroit area. Um, huge lifestyle change, diets changed, active lifestyle kind of floated away. So um, that makes sense. Um, and the turning point for that portion of it was after my freshman year, I went to, I went on a trip to Europe and I, I was taking an overnight cruise from Latvia to Sweden and I slowly started like feeling the pain in my legs and my stomach and it just like consumed me and as soon as we were docking I got off the boat and I just dropped to the ground like I couldn't move I couldn't do anything I was just I was like blacked out in pain um luckily my mom was with me and knew right away like okay that's endometriosis like were you on your period when that happened yeah yeah that was the start of my period um, and I think that was the first real period that I've ever really had. Yeah. Um, so I'm very fortunate to have had a high school career, I guess. <laughs> Not many women have that. Sure, for um, sure. So after that, I was like, okay, this is endometriosis. But I never had a diagnosis of it. I didn't know what it meant. I just take birth control and it'll be fine. Right too common, right? <laughs> right, right. And this is, you're still in college. This is still in college. You, and throughout your college career, do you start to have more kind of what I like, yes. I call them episodes? Yep. Yeah. Episodes, flares. Yeah. Um, so throughout my college career, I was tallying it up. I probably went to the ER about 20 different times. And I was just known as the girl who would go to the ER. Um, and I was in architecture school, so that's, it's very, very demanding and you pull all nighters. And um, so it, it took a toll on me. Uh, I never really searched for a diagnosis and I just kept getting worse and worse. And then by my senior year of college, it got to the point where I had to drop classes. I was flunking out um, and there was nothing I could do. Like I just was so sick. Um, and were you just like, this is endo, this is my life. Like yeah, yeah. at that point, like this is, I have to accept this. I take yeah. birth control and this is it. Yeah. And then my mom was like, well, I went through it. Like you can do Lupron or you can do this. And she did so much research for me, but none of it was what my body wanted. Um, I never did Lupron just cause it scared me, but I did take um, five different birth control pills and yeah. But my Spring year of senior year of college, I had to, I had to do something. I had to move forward. So I found an OB in the area. She knew what endometriosis was. Um, actually, since then, she's moved to Boston and works for the endo fund out in Boston. So she knows what she's doing, but she did the first lap and I woke up with a diagnosis of adenomyosis. I never had the diagnosis of endo. So I woke up and was like, okay, all right, well, this is, this is endo's even, evil twin. How do we move forward with this? And that's where um, I started having cyst rupture and in and out of the ER again. How um, old were you during, when you got this adenomyosis diagnosis? You said you were in your last 21. Year of college? Okay. I was 21. Um, is your pain at this point daily or are you now yes to feel sick every single day yes i'm sick every single day food either goes right through me or i throw it up yeah tell yeah. us about your symptoms because i always say this but a lot of people who are listening to the podcast are just starting their journey 
And it's hard to correlate the symptoms, especially when you're in the beginning of your right. discovery period of endo, right? Like you have all of these different things going on, but we all just think it's painful cramps, but right. it's not. It's not, it's not at all. It, and that's what, because then after this, I started going to GI doctors, but I learned that it affects every single cell in your body. It, it's free radicals floating around. Uh, however, whatever method of endo that you subscribe to, it's all of them, I believe. Um, so it, your pain is valid. It's not normal. Um, but the, the GI symptoms are diarrhea, constipation, bloating, um, nausea, even sometimes shortness of breath in my chest, um, leg pain. Um, and the leg pain, was it like sciatic pain? Like would it shoot down your leg or your legs just hurt? Like when you were a kid and people said you had growing pains. Both. Okay. That's both. Good. I mean, again, for people who are listening, there's all different types of pain. And that's why I want Nicole to define it because and it's different every day too. Yeah. Like I was just talking to you, like my kidneys are usually my first sign now before it was my stomach and my nausea. Um, and I, it's, yeah. Yeah. Well, that's how, well, that's helpful. We'll go back. So you get this diagnosis and now you're like, okay, I have anamiosis. <laughs> now what? Right. Um, and then nothing changed. Right. You, so, did you just stay on birth control? Yeah. And like, okay, great. During that surgery, they said they didn't see any endo? No, they said they didn't see any endometriosis. And I am now correlating that to being on birth control for so long. For sure. And I mean, was that doctor, I know you said she's now in Boston, but do you think that maybe she may have not had the advanced skill set to see because it manifests itself in so many different ways, it looks different in every one, you know, every lesion could look different than another lesion. I think so. Cause that was 2012. Um, yeah. and things have just advanced so much, even in the last year, year sure. and a half. So, um, I think that there probably was some sort of endo in there, maybe a tiny spot, but you can easily overlook that unfortunately. Yeah. And that's the other thing for anybody who's listening is just because you didn't have the endo diagnosis during one lab doesn't mean that it's still not there and doesn't mean that you shouldn't, shouldn't still try to get a second opinion at some point if that's what your gut's telling you you have. Agreed. Yeah, totally agree. Okay, so life just kind, kind of goes on as normal at this point. Right. <laughs> right? Like as yeah. normal as it can. <laughs> yeah. Um, so then I started seeing GI doctors. I'm like, okay, well, it's not endometriosis. It's just adeno and that stays in your uterus. So um, what are all these other GI symptoms? Uh, so they concluded with there were possible gallstones um, in my gallbladder. So they took my gallbladder out. Um, and that was a year after my lap. That was in 2013. Um, and at that point it made everything worse and it yeah. wasn't until I was preparing for my excision specialist, um, last year that I realized and read that surgical report that they didn't find gallstones. They found polyps on the outside of my gallbladder and immediately I'm like, all right, well, <laughs> that could possibly be the endo. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, so you do, you don't feel better after the gall? No, it made surgery. everything worse. Um, my diarrhea was I would eat something, and 20 minutes later, I would know if it was a trigger food or not because I was either I was in the bathroom either throwing up or just pooping right. my brains out. <laughs> and I mean, at this point, after that though, are you still like, well, I don't have endo. I have, you know, like I only have anno. Mm -hmm. So I guess. This is just my, like, like, what are, how are you, what are your thoughts? Like, do you remember what you were thinking? Well, I was going into my fifth year of college, wrapping up and graduating. I was busy with extracurriculars and dance team. Um, I don't think I was thinking. You were just. I was just going through the motions and power yeah. through and yeah. um, numb myself to the pain. Sure. Um, I, I was taking opioids almost daily just to get through. 
um, which is a whole nother scary journey. But um, I, I finally decided that, okay, this pain is enough. It's getting worse. So let's circle back. Um, so throughout that journey, I was about chapter. I was, had two different IUDs and um, four different GI drugs and uh, two different types of birth control pills. Um, and I swore off all doctors. I said, I can't do this. Um, no, because you were in your young 20s and you're taking handfuls of GI pills and birth control and IUDs. And yeah. I mean, that is a lot to handle at that age, at any age, but especially yeah. in your young 20s when you're supposed to be like out having fun with your friends and, <laughs> you know. Yeah, and you can't get off, get out of bed in the morning. Yeah. yeah, you're supposed to be like at the bars drinking and partying with your friends in your when you're 21. Yeah. Not that I condone that for anyone who's listening, but you know, <laughs> that's what most people are doing in their early 20s in yeah. college. Yeah. Um, so I Google searched endometriosis specialist. It's like there's got to be somebody who knows about this stuff. Um, and there was somebody at um, – University of Michigan that I've mm. connected with. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I went to her and I told her, this is everything that's going on. Uh, I have adenomyosis. I have IBS. I'm still having a significant amount of pain. Endometriosis runs in my family all the way back as far as we can trace it. Help me. You are like my last resort here. Um, and she looked at me and said, after reading my lap report, well, you don't have endometriosis. Said, okay. Um, what's going on then? How can, what can I do to manage this in some way? Well, looking at your nerves here, it just seems like you're a little bit too sensitive. So let's put some nerve blockers on and figure out if that helps at all. I took that for a month and went insane. What is, is it a pill or is I it like shots? Nortrip, I took nortriptyline. It was a pill. Um, and I took 10 milligrams in the morning and 10 milligrams at night. And it just numbed me out. Yeah. And I don't know, <laughs> being young and in my twenties, that's not what I want to feel. Um, so I went back to her. I said, this is not working. What can I do again? Can I get a hysterectomy? Cause I know that that's how you can help adenomyosis. Um, and she said, well, you're too young for a hysterectomy. I said, okay. All right. <laughs> how old are you at this point? How many years is this after the gallbladder? Um, I think it was the very next summer. So 2014, like 2015. Okay. So I was 24, 25. Okay. Um, and so I just accepted that, okay, I, I, someday I'll have a diagnosis, but it's not going to be right now. Um, I just need to get through grad school, um, get my license, and just kind of get through this chapter of my life so I can focus on it then. Um, right. And for anyone who's listening, it's very disappointing. We both live in Michigan, and U of M is supposed to be like the top hospital <laughs> In, I mean, it's one of the top hospitals in this area, not just our state, like in right. the Midwest. And I unfortunately have only heard very negative things about um, endometriosis and U of M. Unfortunately, I mean, it's very, very unfortunate, but I have, I actually have not heard one positive story from there. I had a friend tell me, oh, there's a specialist at U of M. I'm going to go see her. And I looked at her and I said, please don't go there. Yeah. Um, and I know that that's a story that everybody has one. Um, there's always going to be doctors that just minimize your pain, but that's not, that's not right. Like, no, that's, that's not, not right. okay. You only feel your pain and you know what's going on in your body. So. Right. And walk out of that office and find someone who's willing to listen yep. and, and listen to you. Yeah. Okay. So then you're like, all right, well, this is my life again. Yeah. You're like, well, here's my life. I'm just going <laughs> to dive back into school and stay yeah. really busy. Yeah. And, and I'm assuming that's what you did for a couple exactly. of years. Exactly. Yeah. Until I the did pain that. started screaming in your face. I did that up until 2017 when I think that's when I first met you at the yoga event. 
um, in Royal Oak. And that just opened my eyes. <laughs> I'm like, oh my gosh, there's other women who understand what this is. What? <laughs> it's not just me and my mom out here, like trying to figure it out. So, <laughs> um, thank you. Of course. I'm really grateful that you were there. Gosh, now I, I yeah, I remember that. And that I took, was a while ago. One of my best friends and she's like this, you need to follow up with this. You need to keep going because this is, this is what it is. Yeah. Um, so if it hadn't been for going to that event, I don't know if I would be where I'm at today. Um, and that started my journey to, um, connect with one of my best friends and, um, we went to college together, but we never really connected then because no one really wanted to talk about their periods then even in college. Yeah. And, um, she told me about excision and I was like, okay, well that'll never happen to me because Michigan doesn't have an excision specialist. And they didn't until 20 late 2018. 18, yeah. Yeah. So again, just kind of accepted, okay, oh, that's something that I'll have in the future, but it's not right now. It's not for me right now. Yeah. Um, but that's when I started diving into the endo diet and what I could do and, um, seeking an official diagnosis with someone who knew what endometriosis was and someone that would listen to me and my, my pain. Um, so I found a doctor and the first time we met, she scheduled an, a laparoscopy like right away. Um, and that was three days before my 27th birthday. <laughs> so in September 2017 um, is when I had my first official diagnosis of endometriosis. Um, I remember rolling into the ER room or OR room and I told her, I was like, you're not going to find anything. And she looked at me and said, well, why? And I said, because they never find anything. There's not going to be endo in there. And she kind of gave me a look of like, all right, challenge accepted. Yeah. Um, and I woke up and I had the diagnosis and finally, I'm trying not to cry right now. <laughs> it's okay. I mean, you can cry. It's okay to be vulnerable. It's, it's a lot. It's a lot because you went through all of that and you had to fight to get that diagnosis. And I knew what it was like, yeah, my whole life almost. Of course. Yeah. It ran in your family. <laughs> Yeah. So what did she say? I mean, she's, she wasn't an excision specialist, no. but did she try, did she do ablation, at least try to remove what she could? Unfortunately, she did the cut and burn. Yeah. Um, she cut what she could and. But you got the diagnosis. I but mean, I got the diagnosis and I, at that time, that's all I knew. Um, so it was good. It was really good up until it wasn't. <laughs> Yeah. Um, I started realizing what ablation actually was, and I was so sick by eight months post op. Yeah. Um, so in 2018, you were yeah. now just so sick. I was, yeah. Yeah. And I was um, running a $55 million project with my team. Um, so I had graduated from college. I'm out in my career, just getting started working God long hours and getting up every day and running and just kind of pushing through the pain. And yeah. if I was down, I wouldn't let myself be down for more than a day um, because all through college and up leading up to that point, I didn't want to be seen as the girl who was always sick because I was the girl who was always sick. I still am the girl who's always sick. <laughs> I understand. <laughs> um, so I knew about excision and did you start point. doing like research? Like, did you start getting on like groups and doing research? Yes. Yeah. And your friend told you about excision and just again, for anyone who's listening, if you haven't listened to other episode, so there's two types of surgeries you can get for endometriosis. One is ablation, and that's where they actually kind of just burn the top layer, the superficial layer of the disease off. And the disease is tissue that's similar to tissue that's inside your uterus. Um, 
And if you just burn the superficial layer off with ablation, unfortunately, it's not really getting the, the root and the, and the root cause of the disease. So for some people, it can work. And so like, I don't want to shame it. Like if you're, I, I, I've just heard it's worked for some That's people fair. and some people it hasn't, right? Um, you have to listen to your own body and make your own decision. Excision is where they actually cut the disease out. So think of a weed, either you pop the dandelion's head off, which is ablation, or you rip the whole root out, which is excision. That's the difference between it. So, you know, Nicole probably didn't feel well after eight months and I experienced something very, very similar to her where after six months I had my first ablation, I felt worse. You know, if someone's in there and angering everything, you already have a lot of inflammation going on, after an ablation surgery, my assumption, not a doctor, um, is that that surgery kind of angers the disease because someone's in there messing around with it. And then it's like, hello, here I am. And it, it gets angry. Now that doesn't happen for everybody, but I've seen it happen in many cases. So, yeah. And so, so there's yeah. some groups out there. If you're looking for doctors, there's two groups that I always recommend. One's Nancy's Nook and the other one is Endometropolis. Um, some of these groups can be very political. So I encourage you to do your research in both groups to make sure that you're getting the correct information. I digress. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, so eight months after my surgery, I was feeling way worse. Yeah. Um, and I went back to the doctor and she basically said Lupron or bust. Um, and that's when I said nothing. I'm not, I'm not going to do anything. I'm going to blaze my own path and stick it to all these doctors that have told me I'm, I'm not sick or whatever. Um, so that's when I dove into the endo diet. I learned more about excision. Um, and the endo diet is an, just a low inflammation, anti-inflammatory diet. And you can Google that all day. Um, I, and I found that it works different for everybody as well like soy is my biggest trigger but gluten may be somebody else's biggest trigger Absolutely. so that's where everybody is different yeah. um you got to test it that's just it's a it's unfortunate part of yeah. the endo process is testing and rinse and repeat is what i like to tell yeah. people is keep on testing everything yeah um yeah, and I, at that point, I was also on the low FODMAP diet uh, for GI symptoms. So I just added all of these no foods to my list. And every time I would eat them, I would get sick or I would flare up in pain. So um, just kind of did my own research and listened to my body or learned to listen to my body because I wasn't doing that for the previous 18 years of my life. Right. Um, and... At that point, I knew there was an excision specialist in Michigan, finally. Um, so I told myself, all right, well, I just had this lap. Um, let me give it a little bit longer. I, I don't really want to cut myself open right away again because right. I don't want more scar tissue to form. Um, and I had a, this Europe trip planned for my 28th birthday and with a couple friends. Um, and I was like, okay, I'll just wait until Europe. And after Europe, I'll, I'll apply myself and I'll get excision and life will be great. Um, and that's where Brandon proposed, uh, was on the trip. So awesome. coming, coming back from Europe, I um, get back to my job and I'm laid off. Um, and that means I didn't have health insurance. I um, sunk deep into depression and anxiety and my pain was just getting worse and worse and um, I felt paralyzed by all of those things yeah um, but I was able to figure it out um, Brandon and I were able to declare a domestic partnership and I was able to be on his health insurance um, and I fought and we got excision. Um, I say we because it's a team effort. When you go into excision, it's it's not just you. <laughs> yeah. It, it's you got to have a team behind you, and if you don't, um, reach out. The community is on un unprecedented. It really, really is. Um, 
I was going through some notes today from right before excision and just overwhelming, just overwhelming amounts of support from the community. Um, so you're not alone for those of you who are listening and please keep speaking out about it. Yeah. Uh, so I remember walking in hunched over holding my body cause everything stuck together. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I woke up and I heard the, the first I heard the machines going off and then I heard someone yell in like a very stern voice, Nicole, you have to breathe. And I was like, okay. <laughs> so I took a deep breath and then I felt all the pain from surgery. And then I took another breath and I didn't feel endo anymore. It was gone. I, I don't have any words for it. Yeah. <laughs> I have chills just hearing you say that. It, it was gone. Yeah. I looked at my mom and told her it was gone. And she looked at me and just started crying and said, I know, honey. Um, it was a very emotional moment for us. <laughs> yeah. But it was also a very painful chapter right after excision. It, you don't realize it unfolds every other trauma you've ever lived because it's traumatic. It's so traumatic. Um, and fast forward, I'm today I'm 13 months post excision. I didn't think I'd make it. I didn't think I would make it to here. Right. I rolled into that surgery, not even thinking I would wake up. So to be here talking to you who <laughs> has been here all along since the beginning of me knowing what endo was and other people knowing what endo was is just, hmm. <laughs> it's freeing. Good. That's great. I mean, it's very inspiring to hear you say all of that. And this, this podcast will change people's lives. Just you saying those words. I used to listen to this podcast um, every single time I went to pelvic floor therapy and every time I left pelvic floor therapy. And I honestly think that's what kept me going because it was right after excision. And this is, that's right when you first started the podcast mm -hmm. and it was, it was so validating yeah. to know that although this is an unfortunate disease, it has brought some of the best people into my life. Yeah. Warriors. We are, we are some <laughs> of the strongest people out there. I'm telling you, people with endo are incredibly resilient and it, it's an amazing community. And, you know, I think you inspire a lot of people by telling your story too. So in, after that recovery was tough, can you tell us a little bit about what happened throughout that recovery period for you? Well, the first five days, um, I overdid it. <laughs> I knew I didn't have endo. I was feeling great. And then all of a sudden I'd get the sharp pain, but it was different. Yeah. It was the surgery pain. You're healing. I I days, keep, you're still healing. <laughs> I know. I had to keep reminding myself. Of, <laughs> it's all right. hard though. Yeah. Yeah. It's, hard. It's, hard. yeah it's very hard. It's very, very hard. And then, um, I started writing a trauma narrative of everything that I had been through. And um, when this all first started and throughout Brandon and I's relationship and it's all the things that have come up were because of endo and in some un, un, underlying way, like it, it's not screaming endo in my face, but like, I can pinpoint times in my life where I knew that I, I wish I knew what I know now then, but yeah. we can't go back and relive it. So right. um, you just got to heal from it and heal from all the other past trauma that it brings up. But the, the recovery is a stop and go. It's a constant up and down. Um, we always say recovery is not linear. And so it true. is not, it'll take you up and down and around and upside down. It, yeah. 
it's, it's a wild ride and I'm still dealing with it. 13 months later, I'm still healing from excision. I, I can feel um, my scar tissue starting to form and I can feel some adhesions and I'm just kind of noting it, but it's not, it's not painful. Um, it's tight. So I'm just kind it's of almost keeping like a tight, yeah. an idea of how to move forward after this. Cause I know excision is the gold standard. It's not a cure but it will give you some of your life back. Yeah. Um, do you feel that you've gotten a, a big percentage of your day-to-day -day life back? Wildly enough, only in quarantine. Because you're taking care of yourself and because resting. I have to take care of myself and I'm resting and I'm doing the things that I need to be doing. Big and lesson right there, Nicole. Yeah. Big lesson. <laughs> hey, for me too, I understand. <laughs> I understand. Yeah, um, I don't think I've felt healthier since I was eight years old. Um, what are some of the things you're doing to take care of yourself for the listening audience? So the, the things that I have found are drinking water. Um, it sounds simple, <laughs> but it's drinking. I only drink water and coffee and wine and tea. That's it. I, and I mostly water. I try to drink half my body weight in ounces every single day. Um, I walk every single day. I try to stretch. Um, I recently found meditation and that's been a game changer for me. Mm -hmm. I never did that before. Um, or at least I could never get into it. Um, I've talked a little bit about the healthy foods I eat. Um, yep. Are you still doing, um, the low inflammation diet. Yes. So I still, I still flare up severely. That was the other thing is after excision, I was like, Oh, I can eat all of the things again. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry for laughing. We're laughing together. Because that, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so I went back to eating gluten. Um, <laughs> Got a I, loaf of bread, you know, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and then quickly realized last August that I can't do that. Um, so it's, uh, I still have no gluten. I don't eat soy. I um, eat as, as much organic food as possible. Um, I follow the, the dirty dozen. Um, and that's just a list of the fruits and vegetables. I don't know if you've talked about it before, but it's, I haven't, but yeah, please talk about it. It's the list of, um, 12 fruits and vegetables, uh, that are, most infected with pesticides and um, chemicals in the growing process. So I try to eat clean. Um, there's also the clean 15. Uh, these are all Googleable. Yeah. Um, I use clean products. That was something leading up to excision that had changed my life. I slowly switched out my products. Um, so I have clean shampoo. And what I mean by clean is it doesn't, have the parabens or the harsh chemicals that can mess with your endocrine system and your hormones. Um, it's a lot of work to do all that research, but there are thankfully many people who can be resources for that now. Um, the dirty, what is it? The, the app that I use that I can quickly yeah, search. There's a website and an app. I can't remember the website Think right dirty now. Think Dirty is the app. Yeah. What is it? Think Dirty. Think Dirty. Okay. Um, and some of the products aren't on there, but you can look at the different um, brands as well. And I switched all my makeup to clean products. Um, right. And so for people who are listening, parabens, again, and hmm. dioxin are two chemicals that I don't know that this is proven. I don't think there's an actual proven fact for it, but they have been shown to be like in your body, your body can interpret it as an estrogen or like a phytoestrogen. Mm -hmm. And with endo, that is something that we don't want extra of in our body. So I, I did a very similar thing as Nicole, like slowly, like this is yeah. a lot of information. It can be very overwhelming, but like slowly <laughs> over time, I, you know, I was using like shaving cream to shave my legs and I like looked and I was like, oh my goodness, there's so much chemicals in it. You know, like now I just use my hippie soap is what I yeah. like to call it. But <laughs> But just slowly as you can, when you start to get new products, you can transition over. And there, there are products that are not crazy expensive because I know that that can be a hurdle too, um, like St. Ives. Like that's a very 
inexpensive product, but it, they have a, a lot of reduced chemicals and parabens in their products. And so just if you are listening and then plastic, I don't know if you were going to talk about that, but like, I unfortunately still drink out of plastic. I'm trying to get out of the habit. It is BPA free at least, but don't microwave your food in plastic. Don't heat anything in plastic because that's potentially could leach chemicals into your food. So yeah. try and do glass. You can get a really nice like glass set from I think Bed Bath and Beyond Pyrex. I think it's twenty dollars. Like so I again like you like I slowly started to switch as the time came. Like I got a Bed Bath and Beyond coupon. Then I would go get my my glass and kind of transition out all the this took years though. And I, yeah. I'm sure for you too, like yeah. this took me years to do. And, and I'm still going through it. Same. Yeah. Yeah. It's it. And thank you for saying it. It's very overwhelming to hear all of this all at once. And yeah. that's totally valid because you're like, Oh wait, this thing I've been using for 15 years is actually help, like hurting me. Yeah. Um, same. I had no lotion, makeup, right. same. Like yeah. I was using all of this stuff. And when I started to turn over and read the labels, I was like, Oh my goodness. That feeling of like, Oh, yeah. <laughs> what am I doing to myself? Yeah. And look, yeah. you don't have to be perfect and do all of this. Like I said, it's overwhelming, but if you can take some of these little steps, it, it, it could potentially help. Right. And, and some people it might not help. And some people it'll, you can tell a difference right away. And I'm one of those people that's somewhere in between as I, I can, notice it when I go back to something now, but I didn't notice it when I was transitioning. Yeah. Um, hundred percent. And then, uh, the tools that I've used is I swear by CBD. Um, it's helped me the tincture and the salve. Um, I usually use the tincture more for anxiety. Um, so throughout all of this, I've probably, as you can relate, have, gotten social anxiety um, because it's hard to go out and not realize like, oh, am I, am I have to leave early? Like, what's my escape plan? And if, if I'm going to be in pain, like how, how do I manage that? Um, so just taking the tincture is kind of calm those thoughts down a little bit. And it's, some people think that CBD gets you high. Um, and I understand like why you would think that it's, it's not true. Um, and it's actually very, very natural um, to use. And the salve I put on my, um, adhesions and my scars, and that really, really helps calm on the pain. Um, I am fortunate enough to be able to use cannabis, um, and in severe high, high pain, um, days. Um, that wasn't always an option. So I, when I swore off all doctors, I also swore off opioids and um, I kind of took a hard look at myself in the mirror and said, I can't be doing this to myself anymore. Um, and I'm not pill shaming cause I know it works for other people. Um, sure. for me, I became too dependent. Um, there were days where I'd feel a little bit of a twinge and I would just take it and then the pain wouldn't even be. So then I would just be high on pain pills and that's not right. right. Um, for me at least. Yeah. Um, so I'm very thankful to be able to use cannabis for those types of situations because I can kind of taper up or taper down if I need to. Um, one tool or one tip that I did learn through this was if I accidentally use too much cannabis, I can use the CBD to help calm that down. Um, so CBD can help in uh, that sort of situation. <laughs> Yeah, that's like for me. I can't like I can, I can do CBD. I can't do right. Marijuana. I can't. I get anxiety. It makes yeah. me actually more anxious. Now I haven't tried it in years and years and years, but I probably should. But I just remember like I did not like it. Like I was like I remember trying it once when I had really bad cramps and I felt like I all I could do was focus on the pain yeah. after I like smoked yeah. and I was like. Never again, never again. I also think that's where people need to find what works best for them because there's so many different yeah. types of cannabis out there yes. and what works best for certain things. And then medical grade is like way different than right. something you buy off, off the street. street. Yeah. <laughs> well, and that's why, like, again, we're in Michigan, so we're really lucky. And I know our Canadian listeners on one of the podcasts, it was so funny. <laughs> someone was like, yeah, the postal service is the biggest dealer in the country because they can order it through the mail. Yeah. <laughs> it's so funny. But for the states that you can get it, or if you can't, CBD is great. But 
I'm excited for here, we're about to get um, dispensaries. And I think at that point, I will feel comfortable because you can go in and talk to someone just like yeah. you would a pharmacist, right? Like mm -hmm. you can go talk to a bud tender and, they, and you can say, I don't want to be anxious. I don't want to feel crazy high. I just need my pain to go away. And they can recommend something for you. And so, some of them are really, really great. And you walk in, they say, tell me what's going on. I see yeah. your condition is endometriosis. I'm so sorry. Like yeah. here is what I've done for my previous endo patients. Yeah. So it's, it's a very um, patient to patron relationship. It's not, Hey, give me some weed. <laughs> yeah. Right. It's, it's, it's so taboo and it shouldn't be. And oh. we're like, other things should be taboo. And, you know, I was talking to someone on a podcast a couple of days ago, I'm too sensitive to take pain medication. My stomach is a mess from yeah. endo and I, I can barely handle Advil. And so it's like, there's no way I could take heavier painkillers. And that's mostly because my stomach and because of years of mm -hmm. taking Midol and Advil and um, I can't remember the pink pain pill that I used to take in the beginning and you know it was just all yeah. of that and I can't my stomach just can't handle it I feel extremely sensitive to medications and other people with endo I've talked to that also feel that way too so you know cannabis is such a great alternative mm -hmm. if it works for you right and some people it doesn't work for and that's okay yeah. too yeah um heating pad like <laughs> go all day on the heating pad um but ice helps in the deep deep pain um ice has been the only thing that's really been able to touch that um so i know everybody's a huge com or huge cheerleader for heating pad but ice is also a valid thing to use yeah. um essential oils um tea. I've demanded a stand-up desk from every employer now. Yep. <laughs> um, Same. And supplements. Um, the supplements that I take are uh, a long list, um, but mostly magnesium to take to help with pain management and muscle cramps. Um, I take DIM because I also have PCOS, which was something that we found before, right before excision. Um, and um what other ones would i recommend turmeric oh turmeric but sorry. make sure you have the cur curcumin i mm -hmm. don't know if i'm saying curcumin. it right yeah. in it because that will unleash the anti-inflammatory properties that um turmeric has um if it doesn't you can use um, black pepper that will help too um or make sure it has black pepper in it so yeah right <laughs> um yeah those, that's kind of what I've done, what I've tried. I've done herbs, Chinese herbs, um, acupuncture, the different birth controls, two different IUDs, right. um, kinesiology, chiropractor, pelvic floor therapy. Um, and again, I'm a huge cheerleader for the, the stand-up desk because sitting all day and sitting on your pelvis all day is just it's not great for us with, with other issues going on. Yeah. Yeah. I alternate, I used to stand all day. Unfortunately, my pain in my back's gotten worse. So now I, I do a combo. I like to call yeah. it a combo where I go up and down switch and try to walk around on calls and things like that. But yeah, the stand up desk helped me immensely as well. Yeah. And so I'm sure people may have questions further on this. I just started a new Facebook group for the podcast specifically. Yes. So and it's very small right now, which is great. I'm going to try and keep it very intimate, but uh, Nicole will be in that group. I'm assuming she'll be fine coming in there. And if you want to have conversations further with her under this, I'll post this podcast once it's live and she can probably give you some recommendations on the brands and things like that that she's talking about right now so if you want to join that group it's linked in the show notes thank you yeah, yeah for sure is there anything else you want to add i mean you look fantastic like you're glowing <laughs> i mean you just you look really great i mean you look healthy and that you're feeling a lot better and that's awesome yeah i think the last time i saw you uh face to face it was um right before excision yeah <laughs> Yeah. Um, yeah. And yeah. And I, I just, for those of you who are listening, keep fighting, keep fighting every single day. Even after excision, you think, Oh, I'm not supposed to be feeling this pain. 
just remember excision is the gold standard and we are still fighting for a cure um, yep. and your pain is real it is valid and so are all of your other feelings um, don't let anybody dismiss you yeah. anything you want to comment on to help with mental health like do you journal do you record how do you are there are there any tips or tricks that you have to kind of ease you know you went through that kind of recovery with excision what were some of the things you i know you said meditation and stretching and moving but is there any other thing that you can maybe say that worked well for you um i think the best thing that worked for me was to sit with my thoughts and to write them out um and if there was something that was bothering me to talk to somebody that i trust about them um and that's how i remember waking up from excision as I sat with myself and I said this is something feels off and I wrote about it and it sounds weird but you think you know what you're going to write about as soon as you start writing but your thoughts will just kind of take over in a weird translucent way um, and it helps immensely it helped me realize what was important in my life and kind of gave and this is just even in the last six weeks um, I started meditation and kind of looking inward and how I want to present myself to the world every day. And I look back and on my journey and who I was and some of it is painful for me to look at because I'm not that person anymore. And I know that endo has caused me to unleash in some instances and that's not who I am. Um, and taking it one minute at a time, literally one minute at a time. And on the hardest days, taking it one second at a time. Um, yeah, very, reach very out to the community, advice. reach yeah. out. Yep. There are so many people who are here and willing. And if you don't find your one endo sister right away, it's, it, that's okay. You're not gonna click with everybody, just, just like in real life, um, just keep, keep fighting. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's great advice. Thank you so much for coming on. I really appreciate it. And thank you for all of your wisdom and tips and, and sharing your story with us. Thank you for having me. This has been fantastic.